Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Lisa Mosalvides, and I'm the director of Archipelago, the Island Institute Store and Gallery. As a key component of the Institute's small business work, Archipelago supports artists and makers through one on one mentoring, as well as by showcasing them in our Rockland Main Street storefront and online. We're focused on highlighting the vast array of art and products created by all those who are inspired by the beauty and endurance of Maine's islands and coast. Archipelago also produces programming, including videos, trainings, and resources specifically for artists and makers, like this annual conference, adopted into a new virtual format this year. Even though we can't see each other in person, we can see each other in our mind's eye and hold space in our hearts until we can visit again. Remember, we designed this conference with your input as always, so reach out with suggestions and feedback. With all of this work, we recognize and value the importance of the creative economy in building a resilient Maine. I'd also like to recognize that as we are gathering from different areas of Maine and perhaps the country, I acknowledge that where I am today in Rockland, I am in the homeland of the Wabanaki people and that the places where we all live, work, and recreate are part of this indigenous land. We're posting a link in the chat to share this native lands map. We encourage you to check out the map and learn more about the native land that you occupy. We also invite you to check out the Abbey Museum that offers many, <clears throat> many excellent exhibitions and program opportunities virtually or in person to learn more about the Wabanaki Nations. I'd like to thank you so much for joining us for Instagram Worthy, a presentation from Hannah Richards, the content marketing strategist at Ethos. First, a bit of Zoom housekeeping. Attendees will be on silent mode for the virtual event. We will not be using the chat function today to ask questions, but please chat with the Island Institute staff if you have a technical issue. If you have a general question for Hannah, please click on, click on the Q&A button located at the bottom of your Zoom screen and type it in at any time. We're ending today with just a few minutes of Q&A because Hannah will be joining us again on Thursday at 10 a.m. for an office hour where you can ask your Instagram questions directly to Hannah. Register today because it's sure to be a great opportunity to listen and learn from each other. So please join me in welcoming Hannah. Hannah, I'm sure there's lots of clapping happening in the studios and living rooms all across Maine. Thank you so much for being with us. We're looking forward to this presentation. Take it away, Hannah. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So just bear with me for one second. Here we go. So today we are going to talk about Instagram and specifically uh, Instagram for artists and makers. I'm going to talk about a number of features on the platform, um, how to highlight your work on the platform, how to tell your story, which is an important piece of Instagram, and also how to sell. Um, and so I think it was mentioned earlier, but as I go through a few of questions, please feel free to um, enter them in that Q&A box and I'll try to address them as we go. And then um, if for some reason I don't get to your question, we can definitely talk about it at the end or during office hours. So just a little bit about me. Um, I'm a social media and brand content strategist at Ethos. Ethos is a multi-platform branding agency here in Maine. Um, we do work with the Island Institute, uh, which is how uh, this presentation got set up. Uh, so I do a, a lot of different things at Ethos, but social media is definitely where my expertise is. Uh, we work with a number of brands to um, use social media for everything from brand awareness to customer engagement, um, sales, uh, behavior change. We have a lot of dip fundraising, a lot of different ways that we work with brands. And um, if you have questions about that, feel free to to chat me, but I don't want to spend too much time talking about myself. So I'm going to jump right in. Uh, all right. So the first question I just want to talk quickly about is why Instagram? Um, 
you're you guys are here so probably you already have a little bit of an idea of why you might want to use that platform but instagram currently has over a billion active users that's billion with a b um, that is second only to facebook which has the most active users although instagram skews towards a little bit of a younger demo than facebook um, it's also the third most popular um, platform amongst teens. So Snapchat and TikTok are number one and number two. Um, but when you are looking to, if you are looking to reach younger audiences, which maybe some of you are, maybe you're not. Um, if you are, Instagram is sort of, if you're not ready to jump into the type of content creation that's required for TikTok and Snapchat, um, Instagram is gonna be the best way to reach that younger audience. Uh, Instagram also has seen fast and consistent growth. So um, they were second only to TikTok in 2020 for number of users added during the year. Um, another great thing about Instagram is unlike some platforms like LinkedIn, where people often don't log in more than one time a day or even one time a week, 63% um, of Instagram users log into the app every single day. Um, it does skew a little bit female, although it's not dramatic. So if the product that you make is geared towards men, it's still a good platform uh, for you to use. Another thing that's really useful about Instagram is that it shares an ad platform with Facebook. So I'm not gonna talk too much about ads today. I am gonna go into it just a little bit um, because it's such an important part of the platform at this point, but it is a benefit that if you are using both Instagram and Facebook, um, you run ads from the same platform, so you don't have to learn a new platform. And you can also manage uh, comments and messages and all that uh, through Facebook if that's easier than doing it on your mobile phone. So Instagram is a mobile first app. You can look at certain things on Instagram on a desktop, but it's much easier to manage the app from within your uh, mobile device. So if you don't like doing that, the fact that they share the, a platform with Facebook makes it easier to manage things through the Facebook app. Another great thing about Instagram is that they've recently been adding a lot of new features like Instagram Stories and Instagram Reels, which imitate some of the other platforms that are especially attractive to teens. Um, so like Snapchat and TikTok in particular, um, Reels is a ripoff of TikTok and Stories is a ripoff of Snapchat. Um, but having all of those features and being able to use different types of content like video, like um, photo and video that is 20, you know, only lasts for 24 hours, those sorts of features, you can do it all within one platform. So instead of having to log into TikTok, log into Snapchat, log into Facebook, Instagram is kind of putting all of that in one place. So if you are short on time, this is a great platform to be able to do it all. And then particularly for artists and makers, Instagram is of all the social media, media platforms, the most visually oriented. I always refer to it as like the art gallery of social media platforms. Um, it's very image centric um, and video centric. And so it's a great platform for people that are selling things that are physical products, right? Versus services. So it's great for clothing, makeup, um, art, any kind of physical good that you can sell. And the other thing is that it's actually known for shopping. So it's uh, considered, according to um, Instagram itself, which of course you have to take that with a grain of salt, right? But it is the most popular social platform um, for following brands and 87% of people um, say that Instagram has driven them to make a purchase. They also note that 70% of shopping enthusiasts, I'm not exactly sure how they define a shopping enthusiast, but turn to Instagram first for product discovery. So it really is a platform where people are looking for new things um, and are interested in making purchases. One of the things that I've noticed in my experience is there's a little bit of, if your product could be considered an impulse purchase. And so that's defined a little bit differently for every person, but generally you know, not more than a few hundred dollars. Instagram is actually a great platform to sell directly, i.e. people will actually swipe up and make that purchase right away. If the product that you're selling is a little bit more of an investment, like maybe a piece of furniture or something like that, then you might be better off using the platform as an awareness tactic and then trying to sort of remind people about the product and the benefits and hope that over time they'll make a decision to come back and buy it. So it depends a little bit on what you're making and what you're selling, but I think Instagram can work both ways as an awareness um, sort of funnel generator, it can also work as a direct sales platform. 
So the one negative thing on this list, and this is true of most social media platforms at this point, is that organic engagement hovers around 1%. So what I mean by organic engagement is if you post something on Instagram and you don't pay to promote it, so you're not running an ad or you're not boosting that post, about 1% of the people that follow you will see that. That's an average. So that is averaging out big companies like Coca-Cola with you know, small local makers. And I will say that the good news is, you know, small businesses tend to have a little bit higher organic engagement rate. Some of that is because the people that follow you are people that are actually invested in what you're making. And so they're more likely to engage versus if you're Coca-Cola, there's probably a lot of people that follow Coca-Cola that don't actually care about them and don't react to a, a lot of their content. Um, and Facebook has shown sort of an affinity in the past and especially during the pandemic to help support small businesses. So smaller accounts tend to see a little bit higher engagement than that. But on the whole, not a lot of people uh, are gonna see content that you put out there and don't promote in some way. I know that's sort of a bummer, but it's, it's the reality at this point. Um, and I'm gonna talk today, uh, I'll talk a little bit about ads and then a little bit about other ways that you can try to improve that number. So I know a lot of makers, you know, are not looking to invest a ton in advertising on Instagram and maybe you're on Instagram because you're trying to avoid having to pay for advertising. But I will say that it's very hard to be successful on this platform, especially when it comes to sales without some investment in advertising. The good news about Facebook and Instagram advertising is that it's really cheap. You can, and it's really targeted. So unlike buying a print ad in the newspaper where maybe only a small percentage of the people that see it would be someone that would be interested in your product. On Instagram, and again, their, their ad platform is shared with Facebook you can target exactly who you think your audience is. So if you know that, let's say you're selling artisanal soaps and you know that your main buyer is women between the ages of you know, 30 and 60 uh, who have a certain income, who live in a certain geographic area, maybe they do or don't have kids, like you can take all of these things. Uh, you, could, you can also target by interest. So you could say people that have an interest in sustainability, people that have an interest in art, um, people that are vegan, whatever it is, you can start, you can target people by those demographics and psychographics. And then you can pay to have your post or your content inserted into their newsfeed. So the great, there's two great things about this. One is that you can be super specific with your ad dollars. You don't have to waste any money getting your content in front of, um, you know, someone that has no interest in your product. The second thing is that the barrier to advertising. So if you're looking to put an ad in the Portland Press Herald, you're looking at minimums in the hundreds or thousands of dollars. On social media, you can say, I only want to spend $10 to promote this post and you'll get $10 worth of impressions. So there's not a minimum on how much you have to spend. And a small amount of money can be really impactful, especially if you're targeting the right people. Um, the other thing that's great is if you're just posting content organically, the only people that are seeing it are people that already follow your page. So maybe it's helping you to get um, additional sales from people who have already made a purchase or who have already found out about you in some other way. But if you do use advertising, now you can have your content inserted in the feed of someone who doesn't already follow you, but might be interested in what you have to sell. So it's a great way to reach new people and to sort of build the sphere of influence of your business. Um, one other thing just to note about ads. So a lot of people know about Instagram that when you post an organic post, you can't link it to anything. So there's no live links in the Instagram feed. Um, you can use live links in stories, but only if you have 10,000 or more followers. So for a lot of people, that's a barrier. When you use ads, it running the ad automatically includes a live link. So you're able to actually link to your website or to some other, or a blog or some other location directly from your post. So unless there's any questions specifically about ads, I'm going to move on from this because my experience is that um, people want to know about other ways other than ads that they can help uh, build their following and build their influence on the platform. So I'm going to talk about that, but I will say any well-rounded Instagram account incorporates some component of advertising. All right, so let's talk about the Instagram algorithm. So 
when we're not using ads, the next best way to build your Instagram following or your influence is by understanding the way that the algorithm works. And I'm going to put a little caveat in here that the algorithm A is not published um, publicly. So all of these insights are sort of collective inferences, guesses, um, the experience of people that use Instagram frequently. And also that algorithm changes really frequently. So that's why you'll see things like if you follow a lot of people on Instagram, you'll notice that for a while, everyone was doing tons of stories. Now there's a big focus on reels. Like a lot of those changes are um, brands and influencers sort of figuring out and understanding how the algorithm works and trying to shift their content in a way that takes advantage of that algorithm. So just to take a step back for anyone that's um, that doesn't know, an algorithm is basically a computer um, math equation <laughs> that helps determine who and how many people see any given piece of content. Um, so I, I will say that it is helpful to try to pay attention to the algorithm and, and create content that is optimized for it, but I would also caution you against having your whole Instagram strategy be about the algorithm because it changes so often and it's not a science. Well, the, the equation is a science, but the way that it's applied is not a science. And so you should always focus your content on what feels true and right for you. And if you are being authentic and, um, and putting out content that feels right for you, I always think that's a better strategy than trying to change who you are to fit an algorithm. Because if you do that and then the algorithm changes, you're gonna constantly have to reinvent who you are and what you do. So these are just tips for how you might be able to tweak what you're already creating. Um, so the first thing that the algorithm considers is engagement. So this is a pretty easy one to conceptualize. Essentially, the more people engage with your content, the more Instagram is gonna show it to other people. So if you put up a post and um, let's say you have a thousand followers and immediately a hundred of those followers like that post or comment on that post or engage with it in some way, Instagram says, this piece of content is good. People like it, we're gonna show it to more people. So then they'll put that um, piece of content in more of your followers' news feeds. Um, so one thing just, we were talking about this a little bit before, but not everyone who follows you is going to see everything you post. There's so much content on Instagram now that what shows up when you scroll through your Instagram feed is not just a chronological list of all the posts from all the people that you follow. It's sorted for you specifically by Instagram. And so Instagram takes the pieces of content that are getting the most engagement and that people like the most and they're putting them in more people's newsfeed. If you put something up and nobody likes it, Instagram's gonna say this content must not be that good and they'll stop showing it to anyone else. The second factor in the um, algorithm is relationship. So this is referring to your existing relationship with other people. So if you are constantly engaging with your followers, commenting on their um, content or replying to their comments, if you are sending them direct messages, um, like in their, uh, if they're sending you a direct message or you're sending them a direct message, Instagram determines that you have a closer relationship then if people are liking your, your content and you're not responding or you're not liking their comments, those kinds of things, that's a farther away relationship. They think, oh, this is just someone who follows the brand. They don't actually have a close relationship. So Instagram is going to prioritize content in your feed for people that it thinks you have an, a real life relationship with. So it's trying to figure out who are your actual friends and who are just influencers and brands that you follow. You want to try to make it so that you, Instagram at least thinks that you have personal relationships with as many of your followers as possible and as many people that interact with your brand as possible. Um, if you can get Instagram to think that these are your actual friends and not just random followers, they're going to start to see more of your content. Recency is of course a factor. So when Instagram first started, the algorithm was actually chronological. So it took everyone you followed and it took whatever was posted most recently and just had a chain of content. Because there's so much content now, if they did that, you would never, ever, ever get to the bottom of your feed. Um, and there would be content from people that, you know, if you went on at two in the afternoon, you would never see things that were posted at 9 a.m. You would only see what had been posted at, you know, 1.59 and two o'clock. Um, 
So that is not that the algorithm uh, is not purely chronological, but it does prioritize recency. So you're more likely to see um, posts that have gone up in the last couple of days. Once a piece of content is more than a few days old, it's unlikely to show continue to show up in people's newsfeed unless it's getting tons and tons and tons of engagement. Um, the next factor here is frequency. So frequency means how often you post. So this is a little bit of a tough one um, because I usually counsel people that it's better to post less frequently and have higher quality content than post every day and have the content not be that great. Because what happens is if you post every single day and your content's not very good, then Instagram's going to look and say, 90% of this person's content isn't getting good engagement. And they're, they're going to sort of lower your quality score, or your rating, and that's going to affect the organic reach of even the good content that you put up. So while it is important that you have a consistent presence on the platform, i.e. it's not great if you maybe just throw something up once a month, but if you have a consistent po posting cadence, even if it's only one post a week or two posts a week, as long as that content is good and is getting engagement, that's going to serve you better than posting crappy content every single day, because that's going to bring down your overall sort of appeal in Instagram in the algorithm's eyes. And then the last thing here is the type of content. So I'll talk a little bit more about this as we go through the different features and ways to post on Instagram. But right now, for example, reels get a lot better engagement than other forms of content. And that's just because Instagram has chosen to prioritize reels in their algorithm because it's their newest product and they want people, they want to encourage people to use it. So they're giving you more reach with your reels than with other types of content. Um, they also really like video content. Um, and again, just high quality content. So nice photographs um, or, you know, well edited videos, that sort of thing. And this is true for the feed. I'll talk a little bit about how that's somewhat different in stories. Um, but just thinking about using the, the or creating the types of content that Instagram is looking for, which right now is video and reels. Any questions that I should address now before we move on? Okay, I'll keep going. So what I'm going to talk about mostly today are the different tools on Instagram and I'm going to go through sort of what they are, how I recommend that you use them, what they're best for. But before we jump into that, I want to just make sure we're all on the same page. So doing these presentations is always a little bit challenging because people are at all different levels with um, how they're using the platform and their knowledge of the platform. So I just want to make sure and address a couple of things. So before you start using any of these tools, there's a few things that you should make sure you have set up on Instagram so that you are making the most out of your time there. So the first one is making sure that your account is set up as a business account. So a lot of times people are used to creating a personal account where it's you know my Hannah Richards account. Um, and when you are making an account for your business, there's actually, you can choose instead of personal or creator. So you could choose either a creator account or as an artist and maker, you could decide you wanna be a creator account or a business account. Both of those options are gonna give you the ability to see analytics. If you are set up as a personal account, not only will you not have the opportunity to promote or advertise any of your posts, you also won't get, get analytics on your posts. When you set up your account as a creator account or a business account, you will have access to um, analytics to see how many people are seeing your posts, um, what the engagement rates are, um, and a number of other uh, KPIs or key performance indicators that you can look at. It also allows you to link your Instagram account with your Facebook and manage them both from um, business manager. So there's a lot of benefits to doing that. Uh, and I would definitely recommend setting up your account as a business or creator account. One benefit of a creator account is that and this is really tactical, but in Instagram reels, the way that the music licensing works is that business or brand accounts uh, are not able to access the licensed music in reels because of copyright issues, but creators, i.e. like in Instagram influencers, and you can put yourself as a creator if you are an artist um, or a maker, that's sort of up to you, but um, do generally have access to the licensed music. So you can create reels with popular music as a creator account. Hey, Hannah, we yeah. have a couple of questions about changing Instagram accounts. Um, one 
one viewer is wondering, can we change an account from personal to creator after we've been using it? And um, can we transfer from personal to business after a while? Yes, you absolutely can. And Instagram wants you to. Um, I can uh, maybe in the, either after the session or in the office hours, um, sort of share my screen and go through what you actually have to do, but you can go into the account settings on your account and you can change it to a business or creator account at any time. Um, Instagram does have the ability to like reject you. So if you try, if you had a business account and you were trying to change it to a creator account, Instagram might look at your account and say, nah, nice try. Um, but in that case, they would just not let you change it and it would remain whatever it is. But generally they will let you change any account into a business account. Does that answer the question? Hopefully. I think it does. Thank you. Sure. Uh, the other thing that I recommend doing is once you're set up as a business account, you can connect it to Facebook and connect it to if you have a business manager account on Facebook, which if you don't, again, I recommend creating one of those. That's what you would use to run ads. It's also what you would use if you're looking to sort of manage your Instagram account from a desktop versus a mobile app. Um, so it just makes it a little bit easier to sort through things on there. Uh, so I recommend connecting those. Another kind of best practice is to make sure that on your Instagram account, you include your website and contact info in your bio. So again, this is something that you get access to when you change to a business or creator account. You can enter a website, you get one link in your bio where I recommend you put your website. Um, the other thing you can do is when you have a business account, you are able to put in um, sort of like a different methods of contacting. So you can put your phone number, you can put an email, um, there's uh, a bunch of different options for how you want people to reach out or contact you and you'll be able to enter that information. So definitely make it as easy as possible for people to get in touch with you if you have a physical location to find your business, that kind of thing. Um, the next thing is to align handles across platforms. So this can be a little bit tricky. So if you're on Facebook and Instagram or you're on TikTok and Instagram, the ideal would be that your handle, so your at whatever is the same across platforms. The reason for that is, you know, people are trying to keep tr track of a lot of different brands and in, in their heads. And if on Facebook, you are, you know, at Hannah's soap company, and then on Instagram, it's at Hannah underscore soap underscore company or Hannah loves soap or whatever. It's hard for people to know, to remember what they need to type in or what to look for. So ideally those handles align across platforms. Sometimes that's not possible because maybe you created a Facebook account that's Hannah's Soap Company. And then when you go on Instagram, that name isn't available. Um, so sometimes it's not possible, but to the extent that you can, it's great to align those handles. Another thing that I see all the time is profile images that aren't sized correctly. And I don't blame people for this because Facebook and Instagram are constantly changing how they display profile and cover images for different accounts. So what maybe was sized properly a week ago is no longer sized properly. Um, but a couple things to keep in mind, Instagram is actually a lot better about this than Facebook is. Facebook is changing all the time. And they also have display the images differently when you're on mobile versus desktop. So that can be really challenging. But on Instagram, it's just that circle image. Generally, I recommend that your profile image is your business logo. Um, rather than your face, just because you want people to get that brand impression and know who you are, because they can't go on Google and Google your face, but they can Google your business name. Um, so I recommend making that your logo. And what you need to do is a lot of people have like a square logo, or even if you have a horizontal logo, you need to place it inside a, um, or sort of crop it so that it fits inside a circle. A lot of people have a square logo and they upload it. And then when the circle is over it, it cuts off the corners, um, and you can't read it. So make sure that you're, when you upload, um, everything on your logo fits inside that little circle. And the last thing is I recommend that everyone create a branded hashtag. So what a branded hashtag is, is unlike hashtag love or hashtag soap or hashtag handmade, those are general hashtags that are being used by a ton of people. A branded hashtag would be hashtag Hannah's soap company or um, hashtag Hannah loves soap or something like that, where it has like your brand name or something unique to you in it. And the reason I recommend this is if you are using 
I'm not saying you shouldn't use general hashtags. That's great. But if you're trying to engage your followers or people that buy your product to um, share that product on Instagram and, and engage with you, if they're using hashtag soap, you could spend 29 years going through all of the posts that are hashtag soap and you might never see the ones that are your actual product. But if you use a hashtag that's unique to your brand, you can actually go through and look at that hashtag and see anytime that somebody has used your product and posted a photo of it or something like that. And again, that's a great way to find people and engage with them to make them seem like they are close, you know, relationship to you for the Instagram algorithm. It's also a great way to get content. If people are posting photos of your product and they're nice photos, you can reach out and ask if you can reshare them. Um, so searching through a hashtag is a great way to find those people. Um, ideally, you create that branded hashtag and I would put it in your Instagram bio. And that way um, people can see that this is the way to sort of alert you that they've posted something. So whenever I post a picture of my kids, if they're wearing, you know, a small shop outfit or something like that. I always make sure I tag them and use whatever their branded hashtag is on the product um, in that post. Questions about that? Yeah, we have a couple questions about handles and hash branded hashtags. Sure. The first one is what happens when you change your handle on Instagram to align with other platforms? Yeah, so if the handle is available, you should be able to just change to a new um, Instagram handle. Although you have to, one of the things that you should make sure um, when you do that is that you change all the links. Like if you have links on your website to Instagram, when you change your handle, those links will break. So you have to make sure that wherever you're linking to your Instagram page, whether it's on your website, on another social account, those sorts of things that you're updating those links to make sure that they align with your new handle. Um, if you are creating a completely new account, that's sort of a whole different story um, where you're, there's no way to like transfer content or anything like that. So if you're creating a brand new account, you would have to start from scratch. Um, you know, there's a couple things you can do, like use your old account and say to people, we're moving, you know, to this new account, please follow us there, that sort of thing. Um, but there's not like a way to transfer over all your content. So generally, if possible, I would recommend using your existing account and changing it to a new handle. One thing that's kind of complicated about that is once an Instagram account is created with a handle, that handle is unavailable. And even if you delete that Instagram account, that handle is still unavailable. So if in the past you um, created, you know, at Hannah's Soap, and then you deleted that account, and now you want to change your Hannah's Soap company account to Hannah's Soap, you're not going to be able to do it because that handle is going to be unavailable. So one thing I've seen people do that I just want to caution against is they go and delete, like they created a new account, then they realize I don't want to do that. I want to change my old one. So they delete the, the account they created. Now they can't use that handle anymore. So I'm happy to answer more specific questions about that again, um, because I feel like everyone's situation is a, a little bit different. Uh, but I would say think you know, measure twice, cut once um, before you delete accounts or do anything like that. And then there's the second question, Hannah, which um, is a two-parter. Um, can the branded hashtag be the same as your handle? And what's the difference between at name versus, you know, hashtag name? Wouldn't that achieve the same thing regarding searches? So um, the difference between, so the first question, yes, you can make your branded hashtag the same as your account name if you want, that's fine. Um, the difference is the at handle is how you would search for your overall account. So if you're at Hannah's Soap Company and somebody types that in, they would find your account. Um, if they have a picture and they want to tag you in it, they would use that. A branded hashtag is, hashtags are just the way that Instagram categorizes content. So somebody might not know what your, um, they might not be actually tagging you in the photo, but they're just saying like, so I'll give you an example. This is a little bit different. We did, we worked with the Wild Blueberry Commission and we um, did this trip for influencers up to the Wild Blueberry Barrens. So the Wild Blueberry account is at Wild Blueberries. Um, the 
hashtag that we used for this event was hashtag blog the barons because we had a bunch of bloggers going up there and they all hashtagged their content with blog the barons and then anyone on the trip or anyone who was following those influencers on the trip could go to hashtag blog the barons and see all the content that was being posted about that trip in in one place um Whereas if they had just gone to the Wild Blueberries account, they would only have seen the three or four photos that we reposted on that account. So when you have a branded hashtag, it allows all of your followers to see all of the content that other people are sharing about your brand versus just the stuff that you're deciding to post on your own individual account. So it's almost like a little community that um, up for your followers or your customers to see each other's uh, posts. The, the way one thing to consider when you're creating a branded hashtag, and I can't remember if this was part of the question or not, but is you just, you can go on Instagram and just search a hashtag and it will tell you how many posts are already on that hashtag. Anything with like less than 150 or 100 posts is not really being used. So you can kind of claim that as your branded hashtag. If I search Hannah's soap as a hashtag, there might already be another soap company or something that's using that. And if there's 100,000 posts on there, then it doesn't really, that's not really a branded hashtag, right? It becomes kind of a general hashtag or it's somebody else's branded hashtag. So you just wanna look up the hashtag and make sure that there's not already a ton of content on it and that it's something, we call it an ownable hashtag. So something that you can use and be fairly certain that the content being posted on that hashtag is related to your brand. And that's why I recommend using your, your business name or something associated with it in that branded hashtag. Are there any other questions on that or should I keep keep moving forward? I think you should keep going. Thanks, right. Hannah. Great. And again, I'm happy to talk more specifically about this stuff um, either after or in the office hours. So the tools that I'm going to go through today, um, Instagram has a number of different features you can use. There's the Instagram feed, which are the square photos that you see in the main piece here. There's stories, which are you, you access them by clicking that circle where, um, around the profile image, and that will take you through stories. They live for 24 hours. I'll talk a little bit more about them in a second. Reels is Instagram's attempt at copying TikTok. They're essentially um, videos that you edit together and you can um, use popular music uh, in the background to create sort of a fun music video. Instagram TV, this is for either longer form video content. So in the feed, Instagram only allows up to one minute videos. Um, Instagram TV, you can post longer videos. You can also have episodic content. So if you say, oh, we're gonna do a you know small business feature every Friday or something like that, and you know you're gonna have an Instagram TV episode come out every Friday. Um, Instagram has ads and shoppable posts. So I'll talk a little bit about how to make your posts shoppable. And then of course, influencers are a big part of Instagram as well. So I'm gonna go through each of these. I know it's kind of quick, but um, again, I'll have those office hours to talk more about any of this. And I'm gonna just give you um, an overview of what the feature is and the best practices for using it. So starting with the Instagram feed, I call this your art gallery. This is where I recommend that you showcase your work. So like an art gallery, your feed should be somewhat curated. Um, that doesn't mean it has to be quite this curated. This one is, you know, color coordinated. It looks really nice. But to the extent that I think in the feed is where you post the photos that are sort of your highest quality photos. This is where you showcase your different products. Um, try to keep it somewhat branded. So if there's specific fonts that you always use, or maybe you come up with a template for whenever you're sharing um, content that has words on it, you use a certain sort of quote template or something like that. Um, you might have a palette of brand colors that you try to stick to, uh, but this is where you really try to make your content look the most beautiful. Um, one thing that I recommend is, you know, on a page like this, it's not an accident that it started looking like this. This person is planning the order that they're putting photos up to make them look really nice together. As artists, this is probably second nature to you guys, but um, there are some tools that you can use, which I'll talk about in just a second to help make your feed look this way. But you really want to make this this feed reflect your brand aesthetic. So whether your brand aesthetic is, you know, homemade, whether it's exotic, whether it's bright colors or muted colors, thinking about how you want people to feel 
about your company and about your brand and making sure that this curated um, stream of photos reflects that whatever you're trying to convey. Um, another thing to note here is that in the feed, I know we've been talking about sort of how to make the most of the algorithm. Uh, carousel images. So that's where um, you put, put up multiple images in one post. And so Instagram will start by showing that first image and then you can swipe across and see other images. Um, those get the best engagement in the feed. So part of the reason why they get the best engagement is there's a really obvious call to action. So when you're scrolling through your feed and you just see photos, you might say, oh, that's nice and keep scrolling. When you see that it's a carousel post and there's multiple photos, you're more inclined to, to actually swipe and see what the other photos are. And Instagram considers that an engagement. So carousels are a great way to sort of boost your engagement score in the algorithm. It's also a way for you to add photos to your feed that maybe don't fit the aesthetic for your sort of gallery here. And what you can do is if you have one photo that you use as, as photo one that does fit your aesthetic, that's what's going to show up in this gallery but you can put other photos behind that that maybe don't have that same aesthetic, but are offering other details about a product. Uh, maybe it's a close up of something or showing, it could even be a, a little video or something showing how to clasp a chain, those sorts of things. You can um, include those and they won't sort of mess up the look of your feed, but um, they'll be available to people to look at. The other tool that I use here um, or that you can use is this tool called Planoly. So it's an Instagram planner. And basically it's a, um, you can sign up for free. Some of the resources are paid. There's other programs like this. I don't have any affiliation with this company. So this is just an example that I'm giving, um, but it does help you. You can upload your photos into Planoly and then move them around to see how they look best together. And then you can create a schedule of you're gonna put this photo first, then this one, then this one to make sure that they upload in sort of the order that looks the best. Um, and it can also help you plan out your calendar in terms of making sure that you're posting consistently and those sorts of things. They also have um, tools for analyzing data and editing photos and that sort of thing. It's a pretty all-inclusive tool. But again, um, you know, I have no affiliation there, but you might want to check it out if you're looking for something like that. Hannah, we have a question from a Facebook watcher, yep. um, which is, does it hurt your account if you go and clean up posts to clean up your feed? That's a good question. Um, it, it doesn't hurt your account to do that. Um, I would hesitate to delete something that got really good engagement or you know a ton of comments just to be on the safe side. And, and what I would generally say is, while I don't think it hurts, I wouldn't spend my energy sort of deleting old stuff. What I would do is just move on. So most people don't scroll you know, pages and pages back in your account. So I would say moving forward, try to create a certain aesthetic. And you know, once you get six, nine, 12 posts in, that old stuff is gonna be buried anyway. Um, so, and, and sometimes then even with the aesthetic, you know, we see, I have clients that their aesthetic changes seasonally, right? So we work with a land trust that in the fall, their photos are all like oranges and yellows and reds. And in the spring it's greens and blues and in the summer it's ocean. And so their aesthetic actually changes seasonally. And so if they went back and deleted every time they changed their mind about an aesthetic, they would have no content built up. So I would say, you know, unless you think there's stuff there that's really bad and doesn't fit your brand at all and you're embarrassed to have on there, delete it. But otherwise, I would just start with a new aesthetic moving forward and it won't take long before that's what you see. All right, um, Instagram stories. I'm just going to keep going unless you <laughs> stop me for more questions. So um, Instagram stories, again, these are, um, this is actually a, a brand that I follow, Lisa's Pieces Jewelry, and I think she does a, a particularly good job here. I think Instagram stories are best for building your personal brand. So while I'm recommending that you use the feed as sort of your art gallery, think of stories as your conversation or, you know, getting to know you as a person. So one of the things that's so important for artists and makers people aren't just buying your product for what it is because a lot of products they could buy, a, you know, not that it would be as good, but you know, you can buy bath bombs at Target, right? 
You can also buy them from artists and makers that put a lot of care into it and you're supporting the local economy. And there's you know, a lot of reasons why people choose to buy from individual artists and makers rather than through you know, big box stores. And one of those reasons is because they wanna support real people and um, people in their community. And so offering people an opportunity to get to know you and who you are is gonna be such a big part of your brand succeeding on this platform. Um, you know, when my kids were little, I tried to buy as many of their clothes as possible from all of these other moms that were sewing clothes and selling them on Instagram. And it just felt really good to be able to support another mom rather than to spend money at Target. Um, and so I think that stories is really a great place to build that sort of personal part of your brand. And if you look at this actual account, um, Lisa's Pieces Jewelry, she does a really good job at this. She has a handmade jewelry company, but in her stories, she shares all about her family life and her kids and what they're doing. And again, everyone has a little bit of a different comfort level. You know, some people don't want to post all of that personal stuff and I get that. Um, but I think you can still share a level, even if you're not willing to share sort of your home life, you could share life in your studio. Here's what I'm creating today. Um, this was my inspiration. This is a great place to actually, you know, hold the camera up to your face, talk to people, take them through um, your daily routines or your creative process, show them a behind the scenes of what your studio looks like or um, what products look like in different stages of development, um, showcase your personality a little bit. Uh, these stories are um, where a lot of people look to get to know sort of the behind the scenes of a brand, who they really are. And, and one of the trends that we're seeing just in general in marketing is that people don't just want the glossy polish, they want to see the real and the authentic. And this is a great place to showcase that. Um, the posts that you put up in stories last for 24 hours and then they disappear. So it's not like you have to worry about whether it fits your brand aesthetic or not. Um, this is a great place to showcase maybe photos that didn't make the cut for your feed, but that you think people might be interested in seeing. The other thing that you can do here is um, you see these little bubbles that are um, below the profile information, but above the squares. Those are called story highlights. And so once you've posted something to stories, you can actually go in and tag it to a highlight. And so you can create highlights um, that are, let's say you have like seven different types of products. You could have, you know, women's soap, men's soap, um, beard soap. <laughs> I just keep using this soap analogy because that's what's in my head, but you know, it could be um, choker necklaces, long necklaces, earrings, bracelets, whatever. And then anytime you're posting about one of those things in a story, you can tag it to that highlight. So it's actually a great way. And those highlights stay there forever. They don't disappear after 24 hours. So it's a really nice way to organize content and almost use your Instagram profile like a website. So if you post into your stories product images of all the different types of earrings that you sell and then you save them to a highlight, someone could go and look at your highlight and just, it's basically like br browsing through a product catalog. See, here's all the earrings you have, here's all the necklaces you have, et cetera. You can also use them to answer, you know, you could do a frequently asked questions one, um, you could do one on your pricing strategy or, you know, any of the things that, um, customers are wondering about, um, you can categorize them in those highlights. Another thing that's really interesting is a trend that we're seeing is that stories content actually get a lot more views than feed content, um, depending on your audience. And so stories are a great way to drive people to your feed. So a lot of times you'll see people post, you can share a feed post into your stories. And sometimes people will put like a sticker or something over it or a GIF over it so that you can't see it. And the person has to actually click on it and view it in your, in your feed. Um, so it's a great way to say to people, hey, there's a new post up, go check it out. Um, and so there are certainly a contingent of people on Instagram that just look through stories and don't scroll through their feed. And so it's a great way to capture the attention of those type of people. You can also run, and again, I, I said I wasn't gonna talk about ads anymore, but you can run Instagram story ads as well. Um, and again, this is something I could talk, if you're interested, I can talk more with you about um, in the office hours, but that's when you do run an Instagram story ad, you gain the ability to have a swipe up link in it. And we've seen really, really good conversion rates, especially for shopping um, with Instagram story ads. All right, let's talk a little bit about Reels. This is Instagram's newest product offering. Um, 
this is where I would focus your attention if you're really looking to sort of win at that Instagram algorithm. They're definitely prioritizing reels right now. They get better organic reach than photos and videos. It's also a really fun kind of engaging way to showcase your work. Um, I don't know that this is going to work. If I click on this, I was going to try to actually show a reel, but basically what you can do is um, you, it, you only can use video, so you can't upload photos here, but you take little clips of video and it could be you just, um, you know, showing the behind the scenes of your studio or talking someone through your process or your inspiration. It could be a styling video or a how to use a product video where you're showing, you know, how to put something on or how to style multiple necklaces, something like that. Um, and then you can put that to music. You can either upload music that you own the rights to, or if you have a creator account, you can use music that's in Instagram's library, or you can just use natural sound, um, whatever's in the background, and um, create these sort of little videos that they not only, you can post them to your stories, you can post them to your feed. They also show up in the reels category on your page and they can show up in the discovery feed on Instagram. Um, they prioritize reels in that discovery feed. Let me see if I can, I don't know if this is gonna work, hold on. Can you guys see this browser? Yep. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of an idea of what these might look like. I know you can't hear the sound, but this is, a, you know, she took some time-lapse video. This is a bow maker. She makes handmade kids hair bows. And she basically did a, you know, a day in the life of her, her home office and showing what the process looks like of creating bows, packing orders, printing order slips, that kind of thing. Um, and then turned it into a reel. So it's not super difficult, um, but they can have really, really good impact. And especially if you do have the ability to use music, you can really make them pretty punchy and fun. Any questions Anna, about what that? Would you, yeah, what would you say is the recommended time length of a Reels clip? So you have up to 60 seconds in a Reel. Um, I would say anywhere between 15 and 60 seconds is appropriate. I, you know, if, you, if it's 60 seconds, make sure it's, it's interesting, right? Like if we watched that video, that video I think was 15 seconds. If that video went on for 60 seconds, you might be like, okay, I get it, <laughs> next. Um, but you can create them up to 60 seconds in length. And one other question, there's audio in the reel, right? So you can talk in it as Absolutely. well? Absolutely. Yep. You can record your own custom audio. Or again, if you have a creator account, then you potentially have access to music. Yep. So Instagram TV, this is for, so earlier we, you know, we talked about the feed. You can upload videos that are up to 60 seconds in length to the feed. Um, I forgot to mention on stories, you can also upload videos on stories and those uh, each story segment can be up to 15 seconds in length, but you can add an indefinite amount of stories to your day. Again, they, they disappear after 24 hours, but you could do, you know, four 15 second stories in a row, which would be 60 seconds and they, they flow one to the next to the next. Um, so they're pretty seamless. Um, but if you really want to upload long form video, the place to do that is Instagram TV. Um, Instagram TV uh, can be up to 60 minutes. Um, again, what will happen is when you create an Instagram TV or when you upload something to Instagram TV, you have the opportunity to share it to your feed. And that's a great Thing to do and also you can share it to your stories because then it will get more people's attention there and what it will do is it will show the first 60 seconds of your instagram tv video and then it will give people the option click to watch more and when if they click that it will take them into the instagram tv section of the app where they can watch your full video which can be up to 60 minutes long um, just a couple things to note if you're uploading from a mobile device it's going to cut you off at 15 minutes just because of file sizes so if you do um, want to upload a 60 minute or a longer than 15 minute video, um, you will need to do that um, from a desktop. Uh, the other thing to think about here, so again, I definitely recommend cross promoting when you upload something to Instagram TV, make sure you're either sharing it to your feed or sharing it to your stories um, so that people know how to find it. Also consider, make sure you're using hashtags on it because people are searching for content. So on Instagram, people actually do search hashtags to find content for things that they're interested in. So somebody 
um, you know, who's looking for handmade jewelry might type in hashtag handmade or hashtag handmade jewelry, and they would see all con you know all kinds of content that it has used that hashtag. So if your video is about how to make um, you know, hand stamped necklaces or something like that, make sure you use hashtags around that. So, so that someone that's searching for it can find your video. The other thing to think about here is episodic content. I talked a little bit about this earlier, but, um, if you are, you know, create a series where maybe every Friday you do a behind the scenes video or every weekend you do a live Q and a something like that. Um, this is a great place to post those videos and, you know, let your followers know that you're going to be sharing, you know, every Friday, we're going to share a new behind the scenes video or every weekend we're going to do, um, an FAQ, something like that. Um, so just some ideas of things you can create here. So tutorials, how to use your product, how to make a similar product, um, behind the scenes videos. Again, people love to see what your space looks like, what your process is. Interviews, if you can find other people that work in your field or that you're inspired by and interview them and create a video out of that, it's almost like a visual version of a podcast. Um, or using Instagram Live, which you can actually interact with viewers as your you know, videoing. So you can, a lot of people will say, you know, we're going to go live every Friday at seven and people will pop on to ask them questions, etc. cetera. Um, so that's another way to really interact and build those relationships with your followers. Super Hannah, there's so much great content here and we've had some great questions. If you want to just keep finishing your presentation and then we'll, um, we'll we want to make sure to see everything you've prepared for us. So thank you. Sure. Yeah. And there's just two more slides. So I think we're, we'll get through on time. Um, one thing that I want to talk about, and I know there's probably going to be a lot of questions because there's some technical stuff involved in this, which again, I can talk through in the office hours, or there's certainly a lot of um, tutorials online on how to do this, but Instagram does allow shoppable posts. So this is great when you're actually trying to sell a physical product and Instagram does restrict this to physical products. So you can't sell a service through here. So it, let's say you're a hairstylist, you couldn't like tag a picture of someone's haircut and allow someone to book a haircut through there. Um, it does have to be an actual product. But what it allows you to do is you basically input a library, like your a library of um, products that you sell into your Facebook business manager account. So you do have to connect your Instagram to your Facebook business manager. Then you create a product library and you can do that by individually uploading products or you can um, connect Facebook business manager with an e-commerce website and sort of port it all over. Um, and then what that allows you to do once Instagram has kind of approved all of that is when you put up a picture, you can tag the actual products in your picture and it will look like this. It will show the name of the product and the price of the product right in the post. And if someone clicks on that little tag, it will take them either directly to your e-commerce website or it will actually use Instagram's um, e-commerce sort of, they have it integrated into the app and people can actually sort of buy it through Instagram and then Instagram sends the purchase information over to you directly. So for people that don't already have an e-commerce website, you can actually use um, Facebook and Instagram as your e-commerce site. Uh, most people are gonna connect it to Shopify or something else, but um, it allows people to actually purchase right in the app without leaving Instagram. So one of the biggest barriers to selling anywhere is um, having to go to another location to buy something like opening a new browser, searching for um, the product price, that sort of thing. So this really removes a lot of those barriers and allows people to buy directly, especially if you have a product that costs, you know, a couple hundred or less and could be considered an impulse purchase. This is a great way because, you know, you're scrolling Instagram, you see this cute hat and you're like, oh, I want to buy that. If you wait until you've closed out of the app, a lot of times you're going to forget about that. But if it's, there's an easy way to just buy it right then and there, you're going to capture way more people. Um, so if you are able to do this with the nature of the, the product that you're making, this can be a, a really great way to increase sales. Um, just a couple things to know about this. So you do need to have that e-commerce website or you have to upload your product catalog to Facebook, which can be a little bit tricky. Um, you do need to get approved um, for shopping by Instagram. You will need a business account to do this. Uh, and this is gonna work best if you also supplement it by running ads. So you tag these posts with the products in them and then you run it as an ad so that more people can see it. That's where you're gonna get sort of the most bang for your buck. Um, 
just a couple things to know. You do need to download the latest version of Instagram. You need to convert your Instagram to a business profile. Um, you need to be an admin of your business manager account or page and have a product catalog or online shop that you can link to. Um, I am happy. I'll have someone drop it in the chat uh, after I'll drop it in the chat at the end, a link to um, a blog that gives you sort of a step-by-step -step guide for how to set up Instagram shopping if there's more questions about that. Would you say uh, Etsy is considered an e-commerce site? That's a good question. Um, I'd have to look further into it. So Facebook has different um, sites that they have integrations with. So I'm not sure if that's on the list or not. I would think it probably is, um, but I'd have to check. Uh, Okay, so the last thing I wanted to talk about today is Instagram influencers. So influencers get a really bad rap because people think of like Kim Kardashian and they feel like they're fake and they're just hawking whatever products they get paid to do. But there's actually a lot of really awesome influ um, Instagram influencers out there that are true to who they are and can be really, really valuable. There's a couple different types of influencers. So influencers are one of the best ways to improve your reach, not only your reach, so how many people, again, if you're not wanting to pay for ads, this is a great way to reach people who aren't already in your sphere of influence. Um, it's also a great way to build legitimacy around your product or your brand. So if somebody that other people trust says, hey, I use this product, that goes a long way in getting other people to think, okay, this is legit, I wanna try this. Um, Influencers also are strong, strong drivers of purchase behavior. So as much as we want to deny that it's the case, we are super influenced by what other people do. And even if you don't realize it, um, you've probably been influenced at one point or another. Um, what I would say is I um, recommend to most of my clients that you avoid sort of the big influencers because those are the people that a lot of times are hawking like a whole bunch of different products and like maybe they do or don't actually use them. And they might have a ton of followers, but if those followers don't trust them implicitly, then you're not gaining that sort of legitimacy uh, that, that you're hoping for with an influencer. So what I recommend is trying to find more, you know, sort of niche influencers, influencers who maybe have a smaller following, but are truly aligned with your company's values. So if you're making, um, I don't know, let's say you, uh, I don't know, you make um, vegan cookies, right? And you would wanna try to find influencers that are actually vegans that have the same values as you because that person's followers are probably also likely to want the type of products that you sell versus if you make vegan cookies and then you reach out to Kim Kardashian to promote them, a lot of her followers don't care about being vegan or don't, you know, and, and aren't going to be interested in what you have to offer. So while you might reach 10 million or hundred million people, if they're not the right people, it's not going to do any good. So a lot of times these smaller, what we call micro or even nano influencers, this could even just be people in your community who, you know, have a lot of friends and people look up to them. They can be a great way to spread the word about your product. So a couple things to think about. Um, sometimes, you know, depending on the how big of a following these influencers have, sometimes they might you need to, you have to pay them to um, post about your product. Or sometimes people are willing to do it just in exchange for a free product. So you say, hey, I'd love to send you a necklace. Would you be willing to post about it on Instagram? And some of them are willing to do that. Um, also consider a giveaway. So if you might offer to that influencer, hey, I'm going to give you a necklace and I'm also going to give you another necklace to give away to one of your followers. That's a great way um, to get some engagement. And then also what you can do is as a way to enter the giveaway, the followers have to follow the influencer's account and your account. So it can be a great way to build your following as well. And then also remembering that other brands can be influencers too. So it's not just individual people. If you, um, I always talk about it as like finding the peanut butter to your jelly. So you don't want to necessarily work with a competitor, but if you can find someone that makes a complimentary product to yours, try to work with them. And a lot of times you can sort of help each other, right? So if you promote their product on your page and they promote your product on their page, it exposes both of your audiences to these new brands and you can help build each other's followings. So other brands can definitely be influencers as well. 
All right. I know that was a lot in a short amount of time, and I'm glad we have the office hours so that um, more questions can get asked. I'm happy to stick around for a few more minutes if there's other questions, um, or we can chat on Thursday. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hannah. That was a lot of great content. Um, I do believe we have a couple of questions that I can answer quickly if I can um, combine them here. So there's a couple of questions about um, the difference between a creator account or a business account. Can you do shoppable posts on both? And can you use tags um, on a creator account or does it have to be a business account? In order to create shopping tag, like either shopping, shoppable posts or tags, you need a business account. You can tag other accounts through a creator account or, or through a personal account, but you can't do shopping tags unless you have a business account. Great, thank you. Sure. Super. Thank you so much, Hannah. I really appreciate all the hard work and content that you brought to us. I'm really interested to see um, how I'm gonna use what I've learned here today. Um, let's all take a moment to thank Hannah. And um, just a reminder that in the chat is the um, registration link for signing up for office hour. Um, we're going to have that formatted as an open meeting so that we can um, freely ask and learn from each other during that day. And it looks like we have some great questions around branded hashtags, reels, shoppable posts, and transferring from a business account to a personal account. So um, hope to see you then and, and join us for that. A big thank you to our um, sponsors and a shout out to Ethos, Summer Main Properties, First National Bank, Bangor Savings Bank, and Page Gallery. Don't forget, forget to visit the Creative Economy Hub on the Island Institute page where you'll find the Artists and Makers Week page there as well for any upcoming events. Um, on Wednesday, tomorrow, there's the keynote conversation with Gabrielle Melchionda from Mad Gabs. And as we mentioned, the office hours on Thursday at 10 o'clock. And Friday, a special edition of our daily art prompt, which is going to be a live piece with Kim Bernard, also at 10. Um, and remember, there's still time to finish your color walk, which is today's daily art prompt. So get going on that. If you're interested in participating and seeing what that's all about, you can check that up on our page on the Artists and Makers Week. Thank you all so much for joining for us. And we'll see you again, hopefully, at the office hours. Thanks so much, Anna. <laughs>